Hello and welcome to the lecture on gases and kinetic molecular theory. And in this lecture we're going to go ahead and talk about gases, how they move, and some of the effects of it, in particular the practical effects of gases and what's actually going on there when they move. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to define what kinetic molecular theory is. And we can go ahead and take a look at this term as it is right here, where we have kinetic molecular theory. And just thinking about what the words in this term are, we're thinking kinetic, and you guys should already be thinking kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Okay. And then we have molecular, which basically means molecules. So, you know, the motion of tiny molecules. Okay. And so kinetic molecular theory, we're going to go into this uh, in detail. What happens with molecules and atoms? We're going to go over the definition and then some assumptions that we have to use with that. And our definition for kinetic molecular theory is that it's a theory that uses microscopic representations of a gas to help explain the macroscopic properties of the gas. Okay, so this theory, we're basically taking a look at what the tiny particles of the gas are doing, and we're going to use that to explain, in particular, the macroscopic thing. So since gas particles are really, really small and tiny, we don't get to see them actually interacting. However, we can see a large mass of them interacting, and we're going to talk about how those two things are related. So we're going to explain the microverse to use the microverse to explain the macroverse. Now, for this to happen, we're going to have to make a couple of assumptions. And the assumptions that we're going to have to make is that we're going to have to assume that any gas particle has a minuscule volume, meaning that the actual particles of the gas themselves are going to not take up a lot of space. The second thing that we have to assume is that gas particles don't interact with each other. Okay. So that means that if two gas molecules do come together, that they're going to bounce off of each other and that they're not going to undergo a chemical reaction. The third thing, we're going to assume that gas particles are always moving. That in order for them to be a gas, they have to be moving in some form of, or another. Four is that no energy is lost when there is a collision, which means, you know, that there's a constant amount of energy that's going on, and that kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature of a gas. And we're going to go into that one a little bit further when we talk about the temperature effects that are going on here. So the big ones that I want you to keep in mind are that the gas particles are small, and that they don't interact with each other. one more here. All right. Now, with kinetic molecular theory, there's going to be a couple of things that we need to go over in a bit more detail. And since we're talking about gas, we need to go ahead and talk about pressure. And pressure is just going to be a continuous force. You can go ahead and grab your wrist and you can apply pressure. And as long as it's a continuous force, that's what pressure is. Now, air pressure is just going to be a continuous force of gases, or gas pressure is just gases that are applying pressure to a particular thing. We're going to look at air pressure here first, and air pressure is caused by gas particles continually hitting a surface. So all the air pressure that we feel on us right now is happening because gas molecules are hitting us at a certain velocity and speed. On us right now, we have an air pressure 
at sea level of about 14.7 pounds per square foot. So that means for every square foot on your body, or per square inch, sorry, my mistake, per square inch on your body, you are having 14.7 pounds of air pressure on it. So right now you are lifting a lot of air up off of you. And you might not feel like it because this is just what you've become used to. Your daily life is always at 14.7 pounds per square inch, so therefore you're used to having that much on you. At higher altitudes, though, there is less air because the air kind of condenses down as more air presses on it. And therefore there is going to be less pressure. So at higher altitudes, there's actually less pressure. So you might have 14 pounds per square inch instead of the 14.7. When you go from sea level to a higher altitude, so if you were going to go from Florida to Denver, you would end up noticing that there is a difference in the pressure there. And when people do that, they can often get what's called altitude sickness because that difference in pressure makes it a little bit harder to breathe for a little while until your body's able to get used to it a little bit. And right next here, we have an image that kind of shows this right here, what's going on. Notice that up here at higher pressures, you have a lot of space in between these gas molecules but then as you get down lower and lower and lower, they get a little bit more compact. And that's what's going on there with that air pressure, that at lower altitudes, it is going to be more compact than at the higher altitudes right there. And that helps with a variety of things and with breathing and all that. Okay, next what we're going to do is talk about some applications. So now we know that pressure exists. Okay. And we know that these gases are causing pressure. So let's go ahead and talk about those applications. Okay. So we know that pressure is caused by the gases, you know, coming around, hitting things at force, and then essentially uh, creating a force. And we use that in different things. So for instance, car tires or bicycle tires. What's happening there is that we're putting a whole bunch of gas into a tire and we're putting lots and lots and lots of gas into that tire and then the pressure is caused by all of those gas molecules that we put in there bouncing off the inside of that tire. And when they bounce off the inside of that tire, that tire is able to resist the pressure of both the outside air and the pressure of the car on top of it. So it's able to withstand both the weight of the car and the air pressure on the outside. And that's because we put so much in there and that those molecules are constantly pushing against that inner wall of the tire that they're going to end up pushing that tire out so it can resist that. So the great amount of pressure on the inside of the tire is greater than the pressure that is exerted on the outside of the tire. <clears throat> and as an example here, this guy is going to be trying to pump up the tire and he's probably not going to be very successful because he's not going to be able to pump up and put in enough air between pumps between, you know, the tire pressure on the outside of the tire uh, forcing the air out of there. Now also this has effects with things to do with oxygen at higher altitudes. This right here is unfortunately a picture of some of the trash and CO2 canisters that are around Mount Everest. And Mount Everest you understand that to be a mountain that's high up in altitude. It's the tallest mountain that we have on earth. And it makes it very, very difficult to breathe just normal, just normal inhalation, exhalation. It's very difficult to breathe because there's less pressure. So there's less force of the air going into your lungs. And 
that ends up affecting how well you're going to breathe. One thing that they do to help with that is that they exchange the normal amount of air that we have in our atmosphere, which is only about 22% oxygen, and they exchange it with 100% oxygen. And the idea behind that is that if you have 100% oxygen going into your system, you should have a better chance of maintaining well oxygenated blood. As a consequence, a lot of those containers are heavy and they have to leave them behind. Alright, next what we're going to do is we're going to talk about temperature. Now temperature we need to both define what it is and then talk about how it affects different gases. And temperature, you guys know that that's how hot something is, but what it actually is, it's a measurement of the average kinetic energy of a sample, okay? So temperature is actually just an energy measurement. And what's actually going on when you take your temperature is that the thermometer is reacting to the molecules that are in your body hitting the thermometer at a certain rate of speed and that rate of speed is going to change the temperature in the thermometer and as it changes the temperature in the thermometer the liquid is going to be able to expand because it has a greater amount of energy to it. And that's what we have going on here with this picture right here. So this right here is a glass thermometer. And this is a, whenever you see a red one, it's an alcohol-based thermometer. And what happens is the outside particles, and it doesn't matter if this is, you know, your mouth if you're taking your temperature or under the armpit if you're not. The particles themselves are hitting the glass of the thermometer and once they hit the glass of the thermometer, the glass of the thermometer is going to go ahead and interact with the alcohol and as the alcohol gets more energy it's going to be able to gradually go up. It'll have enough energy so that it's able to go up that pipe and fill the thermometer according to the temperature. So this average kinetic energy is being transferred to the liquid inside of the thermometer and that's how the thermometer indicates that there is a change in temperature going on. So it's just measuring average kinetic energy for a sample. Now we're going to talk about a couple of applications that we can use temperature for. So if we are increasing the kinetic energy, we're increasing the amount of force, the amount of energy that a gas molecule has that it can collide with another object. Okay. So if we go ahead and look here, we have a hot air balloon. Now, the air that's in a hot air balloon stays relatively constant. And when we heat that air up, what's happening is that we're giving it more energy. And when it has more energy, it's going to hit that balloon at a greater amount of energy. And that greater amount of energy is going to be able to cause the balloon to accelerate upwards. And it's hoped that the amount of energy that you give to the air molecules then will allow you to go ahead and have more energy than the, you know, 14.7 pounds per square inch that's pu pushing back on you. So you're just increasing the temperature and increasing along with that the energy of the particles as they hit the outside of the balloon. Now, if you want to think about it in terms of pressure, you could do that as well. Because if you increase the temperature, you're also increasing the pressure that's exerted on the outside of that balloon. Now, likewise, this can happen the opposite way. 
And it's not a big issue in Florida, though if you go up north, it is something that you need to watch out for. And that if you cool something down, it'll also decrease in pressure because the average kinetic energy is going to decrease. And if you have a tire, especially up north, you often have to fill them up a little bit during the winter months because the pressure is going to be decreased on that tire. This also explains why, especially if you look at drag racing or funny car racing, that a lot of those people end up spinning their tires and that gets the gases moving a little bit in those tires a little bit faster because they're using the frictional energy of the tire spinning to go ahead and increase the air temperature that's within the tire itself. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go over diffusion and effusion. And these are two terms that I definitely want you guys to know for your exam in this section. And diffusion is going to be the process by which a gas can go from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And this is a concept that's pretty fairly commonly used in, whenever we talk about entropy, which is going to be talking about the energy of organization going from high organization to low organization. This image right here ends up showing an example of the diffusion process. So we have a lot of the gas molecules on one side, and then we have a transition state where we see that they organize themselves to kind of fill a room. Now, especially in the coming years where we have coronavirus, this is often you know how coronavirus will end up spreading too. Like it goes from one solid mass in one person to spreading out over a complete room. So be aware of that, that you know, it does still exist and other diseases will exist in this realm as well. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna go ahead and talk about effusion. Now effusion is gonna be slightly different because effusion requires the gas to escape not through a large volume, but through a very small volume. So the easy way to think about it is to think about it in terms of deflating a tire or through a puncture. So right here, this is an example of a effusion type scenario where you will have a tiny hole and the gases is going to have to exit through this tiny hole right here. Another example that you know is quite similar to, for you guys to think about is using or deflating a car tire. That it can only go through that valve, that's an example of effusion at work. Okay. Now, this right here is going to end up being the close for this lecture on it. Some things that I want you to take special note of is the basic kinetic molecular theory, and then the definitions for these and how that ends up affecting things as we go forward with gases in it.